Good morning. Please stay standing for the reading of God's Word. We'll be in John 2, verses 13 through 25. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. So the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, uh, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Regeneration Church. If you are um, at home because you can't make it here and you're stuck uh, with the roads, we, uh, we will pray for you this morning. It's kind of crazy. Um, middle school, you are dismissed. You're going to go over to your class. And um, man, thank you, Elizabeth, for reading the scripture. She asked if she could flip this over while she was uh, reading it. And I said, no, that's a little dramatic. So... <laughs> Uh, we're not, we're not going to do that. Um, th this morning, though, um, as we are in John chapter 2, I want to welcome you. Again, if you're online, then um, we have a Wednesday night virtual life group. Um, we, we want to be in community. So if you're listening and you have a home church and you're just, this is supplemental, hopefully, and you're just growing, then, then welcome. But if you're watching live and this is your community, then please comment and, and uh, let us know that you're there. And uh, we would love to be able to pray with you and answer questions that you may have. I also wanted to let you know that when you look at the text questions that are on here, um, there's a number, 854-7729. Um, that is only uh, seen during the week when we're answering questions. Sometimes people use that as the church number, and it does, it's a dead number. It's only for text questions so that people can text in their questions. Wanted you to know that. Uh, let's, let's pray, and then also, if you do not have a scripture journal at the information booth, we have some of these available for you. You could hold on to it and... Uh, Use this all through the book of John so you could take your notes. So let's pray. Today, Father, we are opening up your word and the portion of scripture that we had read this morning, Lord, it reminds us that you yourself are zealous, that you are zealous for things that bring you glory and things that are good for us. And God, I confess to you that there are times when um, my zeal just really feels more like apathy or more like kind of a, a casual, laissez-faire, um, just going through life. And so we pray that you would help us to understand and not uh, misinterpret your zeal 
as you being against us, but you're for us. And, and we thank you for that. But God, when we, when we see that zeal, help us to, uh, to deal with it, to realize, God, there are some things that you're zealous about. And we ask that your Holy Spirit would move in our hearts as well. I pray that especially for those that are watching online, sometimes it is difficult to lean into a, a time separated unto you with things at home or distractions. And then even here, Lord, we, we have things going on in our minds and our hearts. So Lord, would you uh, please still our hearts to be able to receive from you this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, I, I do believe that it is Michael Woodburn's birthday today as well. So happy birthday, Michael. And um, he, he would not want me to announce that, but I announced it anyway. Um, turn to John 2 in your Bible or in your scripture journal. And this morning, as we uh, consider this passage, there's a movie out right now. It's called The Jesus Revolution. Um, how many of you have seen it? Have some of you seen that? That's awesome. Uh, if you've seen that movie, uh, you know that um, it, it depicts the early days of the Calvary Chapel movement. It's not just about Calvary Chapel. It's about uh, the late 1960s, early 1970s, where you had Woodstock, and then you had, um, you know, riots. You had division in our country. Uh, you had Vietnam, all these things that were happening. And out of an, a very unlikely group. And, and the crazy thing is that some of you knew Lonnie Frisbee and you were there in the tent with Chuck Smith in those early days. Um, it, it's, it's amazing to see what God has done since that time. Um, there are some of you, like I, I look at a picture like this and it's nostalgic for me going, oh, that would have been cool. But some of you were actually there at Calvary Chapel in Costa Mesa, when the tent was set up and that was your place for worship. And there were people that um, experienced what that was like. Baptisms there in Pirate's Cove during a time that God was using a guy named Chuck Smith and, and a guy named Lonnie Frisbee and other people as well. And I just wanted to share that um, there have been a lot of things that have been um, just at the same time coming together. This movie coming out, along with teaching through the book of John, along with some things that God is doing in my heart. Um, and then um, The Chosen, I don't know if any of you have seen that. There's, it, it's like there's a, a consciousness right now, a, a talking about Jesus. Uh, Joe Rogan was talking about Jesus the other day. He was, and then he was uh, interviewing um, Matthew McConaughey. And then there was also a, an interview with Kelsey Grammer, who plays Chuck Smith in the movie. And like, there's a lot of people that are talking about Jesus. There was the Super Bowl commercial, the, um, He Gets Us. And, and, and yeah, so there's some people that go, oh, it wasn't enough. You know, it should have gone farther. There's other people saying, oh, well, like, who's behind this? And uh, all of that to say there's a lot of talk right now. There's a lot of consciousness. And on top of all of those things, there's something going on uh, at a, a university called Asbury University where on February 8th, at a regular, normal chapel service, at the end of the service, the worship team came up and they kept playing. And then they didn't stop. And, and so usually people go back to class. Like I went to Azusa Pacific. Chapel was Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 10 a.m. And then you went after chapel to whatever your classes were. But they just kept playing. And they wouldn't stop. And then they just kept praying and singing and, and calling out to God. And then that went um, into classes and then went through lunch. And then it went into the evening. And then it went into the next day. And the administration was like, hey, we, we, you know, we don't want people to faint. So they brought food into the sanctuary. They brought drinks and, you know, just people would stop. They would go to the back. And then it kept going and went for days and days. And now in the world that we live in today, there's social media. So after about four days, people were noticing this is four days straight. Like not, uh, not a day of a conference and then you go home. Like they stayed 2 a.m., 4 a.m., 6 a.m. And they... Then the next day, more people, and then they, some people went home. I'm, I'm sure they went home to sleep or drink or eat, and you know. And then they came back, and but it kept going, and then it kept going, and it kept going. And um, just last week, the administration said, "Hey, uh, you guys have finals, so we're gonna we're gonna stop it. <laughs> you guys have to go take your tests." And what I saw as I watched um, and I live streamed because they they had their chapel service, is it wasn't. Um, it was extraordinarily ordinary. 
they're just singing some of the same worship songs that we sing. The message wasn't anything that was so out of this world or uh, showy. It was very gentle. Um, and then Thursday night, as I was watching, this is a picture from Thursday night. That was the, the live stream on Thursday. And uh, we had worship practice, worship rehearsal. And I said, hey, let's just stop. If we could take a few moments. And uh, I just wanted to share um, a live feed. So we just played it right here. And the worship team, we were, just, we were just watching that and we were listening. And I went back to my office and I was studying and um, I, I got choked up because at times they would take a break. They say, okay, someone would come up and share scripture or something that God was doing in their lives. And then they would just say, just pray amongst yourselves. So then people in groups would just pray, like six people, four people. And then um, the microphone, you could hear some of the prayers, and some people praying for their parents and some people praying for their classmates. And, and then there were prayers of repentance. And then there was testimony of students. This one student shared, um, you know, when this started, the first day I was here in chapel and I sat and, and she said, I, I was just sitting there and I was just kind of like more observing because she was going through all these things personally, emotionally. And um, she said on day two or day three, God really began to convict me of other people at the school that I have grudges against. And I just wouldn't let it go. And I just held on to him. I was just struggling. And she said, I was sitting there. And then as the Holy Spirit was ministering to my heart, I finally just said, Jesus, help me to forgive them and take this bitterness away. And I went up to them and I said, I'm sorry. And then they got together, she said, and we just started praying. And she said, and since then, she said, it's only been a week, but my heart is different. I, I've let some things go. And you know, I, I share that because when it comes to revival, um, I, I, God uses flawed people. And I, I also see something that revival doesn't require a large group or a special service or a certain song, a special sermon. Um, it doesn't have to be something that's planned on a calendar. Really, revival can happen in my own life by just being open to the Lord, to what he wants to do. Where I'm not saying, God, 95% of the things that I, I I'm, I'm serving you in 95%, but in this 5%, I'm going to hold on to this. Revival happens when I say, God, please take it from me because I can't give it up. God, please help me to love someone that I don't love. Help me to forgive. Help me to want to want you because I don't want to want you right now. And so when our hearts are like that, there's nothing, there's nothing today that prevents you from experiencing that personal renewal. But if many people together in a common area start to experience renewal like that, that's what's called revival. And revival is when God's spirit touches God's people, where Jesus is glorified, where the word of God is elevated, where it's emotional but not emotionalism where it's a surrender to God of all things that God wants to do and God begins to work and we get out of the way. We, we get out of the way. And it means that we have to clear our schedules at times. It means that we have to choose to make God priority because we can't, you know, in the next chapter we're gonna get into in chapter three in John, Jesus talks to a religious guy named Nicodemus and he tells Nicodemus that the spirit of God is like this. It's like the wind. You don't know where the wind is coming from or where the wind is going. But how much as Christians in, in the modern world today do we say, oh, I know where I'm going and I know what I'm doing and I'm going to plan Sunday morning at this time is when I get my God stuff in. And then I know that Monday morning at this time is when I do my secular stuff. And I know that on Tuesday night, this is when I do this stuff. And, and like we have everything planned out. But I'm telling you that when, when I first came to Christ, and some of you maybe remember this in your own life, everything was overturned. Everything was upside down. And, and, and really it was right side up. And I think that what we're going to see in John chapter 2 is that Jesus still is zealous for the things of God. He is still zealous for people to worship the Father um, and, and not get it into this thing where in this routine, they got into marketplace, they, they, they did this religious observance, but Jesus had to turn over some tables. And so this morning, we are going to look at 
the first Passover that's mentioned in John, in fact, it's, it's actually the, the book of John, the gospel of John, where we understand this chronology of Jesus's ministry. There's three Passovers that are uh, mentioned. We have these three years of Jesus's ministry. Uh, we're, we're going to see Jesus being consumed by zeal, consumed by zeal. You know, and I think about what am I consumed with? What are you consumed with today? The Jews are going to ask for some sign of his authority. And Jesus is going to um, give them this, this kind of a, a riddle in a sense that's going to make more sense later on. Uh, many believed in his name. And then we are going to end with looking at some application of how do we overcome apathy? Because that's all good and well that we should be zealous. But how do you create zeal when you don't feel zealous and you just feel a little bit apathetic? So... Let's consider this first Passover in John. Um, we, we could pick it up right here in verse 13. And it goes on to say that um, the Passover of the Jews was at hand and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, where was he in John chapter 2 earlier? Do you remember? Do you remember where he was? He was in Cana of Galilee. He turned water to wine. He's at this wedding. There's this feast, this, this first sign, uh, this first miracle that shows that he is the son of God and that by believing in him, he might have life in his name. John chose these specific vignettes, these signs, in order to show people um, that Jesus really is the son of God. Now, when we read this, the Passover of the Jews, it also helps me to understand that who else has a Passover except the Jews? But he calls it the Passover of the Jews because John is also written to Gentiles. Um, you don't call it the Passover of the Jews if you're talking only to Jews, right? The, sometimes I hear that uh, Christianity is a Western thing. It's an American thing. And I'm going, no, it started out as a Jewish thing. And the Jews kind of kept that to themselves until God showed Peter that it needs to go beyond that. And then it goes into the Gentiles. And do you realize that Christianity is the most ethnically diverse, socioeconomically diverse, um, generationally diverse religion in all of the world? That it started in Jerusalem. When you think about most religions, they, they kind of centralize in a particular area. Mecca. Um, you might have Tibet. You might have like certain places, you know, Buddhism's kind of centered here and Islam is kind of centered here and there's different religions that are centered in different places. But you look at Christianity and Christianity has been spread throughout the whole earth, all over the world. And so when it says that the Passover of the Jews was at hand, John is writing not only to Jews, but other people as well. And it says that he went up to Jerusalem. That's kind of interesting because when you look at a map, uh, Jerusalem is south of, of Galilee. You look at this right here. Here's Galilee, and here's Jerusalem, and it seems like, okay, they're going south in that direction. Jerusalem is higher in elevation, but it's not just the elevation. It's whenever the Jews would be dispersed in what is called the diaspora um, all over the region, all over the land, during these three specific feasts, these times of celebration, these times of worship, these times of remembrance, they would come back to Jerusalem to the temple and that would be their pilgrimage. And that kind of speaks to me as well when it comes to pilgrimage. They went from Galilee to Jerusalem and we could read this, oh, okay, no big deal, that's where they go. Can you imagine how long it would take to walk there with your whole family? with animals that you were going to bring for sacrifice. From Galilee to Jerusalem, it's about 75 miles. So it, that's a good amount of walking. <laughs> uh, when's the last time you walked 75 miles? You know, it's been, it's been a while, right? If you ever have, right? And imagine your whole, like when we would travel to Southern California, we have, uh, Deanna and I have five kids. When they were little, we would go visit family and we would have our Christmas Eve service and that's also our son Josiah's birthday. But then we would want to get to the family in Southern California in time for Christmas and imagine just packing the Suburban, just filled and then the top of the Suburban, the racks and all of the gifts and it was such a, a like an ordeal to get everything ready and that was 
in a vehicle where we could stop at Jack in the Box on the way, you know, and like we could eat something. And they, they would inconvenience themselves for worship. It was intentional. I'm going to set myself apart for this time of worship. And we live in a world that is so convenient. And one of the things that I want to encourage you, if you are online and you're watching, uh, if you have an opportunity to gather with us, or if you live in another part of the country or another part, uh, uh, you know, away, find people to gather with, even if it's inconvenient. I'm so thankful for online technology that makes it available for people that are at home or can't make it out. But let's inconvenience ourselves to worship God. Let's do what it takes to be around the people of God. As they would pilgrimage to Jerusalem, they would, they would read and they would sing and they would recite these psalms, psalms of ascent, as they would go to the steps, as they would come to the temple. And when they would get to the temple, this is what it looked like. And this, um, I, I needed to show you this so that some of the things here are going to make sense. Uh, this temple that had been destroyed was rebuilt and then Herod um, over these 46 years up to this point in time had, had been rebuilding and adding some things. And this edifice right there is called the Antonio Fortress. That is a, a Roman fortress where soldiers are. They, they could not have a rebellion. If they had a rebellion, it would get pushed down really quickly. And you're going to see later on that when people start following Jesus, the Jewish leaders start to freak out a little bit because they don't want the Romans to just, you know, think, oh, there's a rebellion that's here coming because people are saying Jesus is king. These areas right here, um, that is called the court of the Gentiles. Or if you're looking in the book of Revelation, it's also called the outer court. And then this building is the temple proper itself. And then within this is the, the temple in which there's something called the Holy of Holies that only the high priest could go in. So when we read temple, the word that is used here, I know there's a lot of drawing on this, but the word that is used in the book of John describes this, this word uh, hieron, which is the whole temple area. Okay, so it is the, the, whole, uh, the whole temple. So I'm going to erase this stuff so you can see it there. All right. So there's the temple. You have the whole temple area. And it's at this time that it says Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And then he's consumed by zeal because it says in the temple. That's that whole area. And that specific outer court is called the court of the Gentiles. Because the Gentiles were not allowed to go into that inner building, but they could stay in that outer courtyard. And they were called God-fearers, um, people who were non-Jewish that understood that there was a God, uh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They also wanted to worship him. So they would come and they would bring their offering into the court of the Gentiles, but they couldn't go further into the inner court or into the inner temple. Does that make sense? They had to stay on that outside area. And it's in this place that is the setting of John 2. In this whole temple mount, Jesus found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there. Now, when people would come to worship, they would bring uh, an animal. Usually the Passover, they would inspect the animal for uh, four days leading up to the Passover. Uh, they would make sure there weren't any blemishes, that it was basically their first fruits, their best. You know, you, they didn't give God the, the sheep that, man, this sheep doesn't grow any wool. It's good for nothing. Let's sacrifice it. Let's give it to God. You know, they would give God their, their best, and that's what they were called to do. So they would come, but then there would be people that have sheep or oxen or pigeons, and and they would go, oh, you know what? Your, your sheep is kind of messed up. Do you see this here? And, and they would look at it and, and kind of haggle with them and say, but we have a pre-approved sheep. And this pre-approved sheep is uh, kosher, kind of, you know, like we've pre-approved it and it's, it's good for offering. It's going to cost you something though. And you, don't, you can't go all the way 75 miles back home to Galilee. So this is your option if you want to really worship and, and participate so do you want to buy this? Or what about this pigeon? Or what about this ox? Um, there were also money changers because there was a, a temple tax, which they would have to give. 
but they would not accept coins. You know, our, our coins, can you imagine having a coin? It says, in Zeus we trust. <laughs> but oh, that coin's not good here. You cannot have false gods or these emperors that are worshipped as God. But we have um, our money that you can use. These coins, these are good. So here, why don't we exchange them? And by the way, here's what the exchange rate is. <laughs> um, have you ever gone to an airport in a foreign country and you want to exchange money and at the airport, if you don't have any pre, like if you didn't do some exchange ahead of time, they're going to gouge you at the airport. They are going to take your U.S. dollar and say, here's some pesos. And you, outside of the airport, a few miles away, you can get a much better rate. But the pressure is you need to get a taxi cab right there. And so you're going to have to exchange some of the money. Well, they would say, well, you need to offer something to God. But your coins don't count. Those are no good. Uh, in Zeus, we trust. So uh, here, why don't we give you some of ours? And, and so what they were doing is they were taking advantage of the poor and this is in the place of the Gentiles. Um, in worship, we, we call this building, it's just a building, by the way. Every church building is a building. But you call it something where you worship and you gather. This specific area we call a sanctuary. In a sanctuary, we call it that. It could be called a meeting room. It could be called an auditorium. But it, it's called a sanctuary because there is something sacred that happens in a sanctuary. There's some worship of meeting with God. And imagine if your sanctuary looked like the swap meeting Capitola at the drive-in. <laughs> imagine like you're trying to worship. You're trying to come and bring your offering to God. And our money changers and you hear haggling and bah, bah, and all these animals are running around and it's noisy and babies are crying and, and people are bargaining and some people are panicking because their animal was rejected and they thought it was a good animal and, and, and this is going on there. And Jesus comes and he sees this happening. And in verse 15, I want you to notice that he makes a whip of cords. Now, I, I've never done that. Have you, have you made a whip of cords? Like, how long does that take? What material do you need? Like, did, did he buy leather? Did he take parts of rope? Did he tie them? Did he braid them? Did he weave them? And the reason why I bring that out is that sometimes people see this as Jesus losing control. I mean, this is an intense time, but it's calculated on his part. Um, it, it's something that it, it's planned, it's methodical, it's thoughtful. I'm sure it's prayerful. He makes a whip of cords, so he's under control. He's not out of control. Um, the scene on um, It's a Wonderful Life, I don't know if you've ever seen that movie. It's for Deanna and I, it's our, it's our favorite movie. Uh, when Jimmy Stewart just, he's had it. He's had just one of those, like, it, it's just so much. And he just starts flipping over things and like, you know, sweeping over the table. The, the sad thing is that in, in my life, I, I've seen that when I was a kid um, at times. I've seen that when my dad was really angry. Just very upset. It's before he knew the Lord. Um, I, I've seen curtains in the house just being ripped down. Um, I've seen food being thrown. Uh, I've seen a, a candle being. Th I've seen that kind of an anger. Um, and and I have to watch out because I, I know that there's a part of me that my natural bent is towards passion, and sometimes passion is anger. And sometimes it's other things as well. But, but Jesus has passion and he has zeal, but it's methodical. It's thought out. It, it, and, and in his zeal, he does this. He makes a whip of cords. But then what he does shocks everyone because we usually think of meek and mild Jesus. And know this, he's still meek. This is still meek as far as Jesus is concerned because he doesn't consume them, but the zeal for the Father has consumed him. Um, in God's judgment, you're going to see in Revelation that there is a time that God is very patient, but there is a, a point of wrath. But it is not here where that wrath is fully felt. It's what they were doing was they were taking advantage of the poor. 
Jesus' concern for the glory of the Father. He's concerned for people being able to come to worship. So he drove them out. And, and when he drives them out, I can't help but picture what this looks like. The crack of a whip, what does that sound like? Is he just making the sound or is it hitting the tables or is it hitting people or is it hitting the animals? I, I don't know, but it's this whip and these people are like, what's going on? And you, you don't turn over tables slowly and gently. <laughs> I, he, he didn't come over and go, you know, like I just imagine flipping over tables. And if you've ever flipped over a table or seen that happen, you know that everything on the table goes flying. Not only that, but he poured out the coins of the money changers. Imagine like all these coins, oh, here's the approved coins, and he just comes and takes a jar and just starts dumping it out. And the sound of the metal clanking on, on the, the stone as it's going, and, and coins are rolling all over the place, and these people are, are scrambling for it. It's a real different picture of Jesus, isn't it? Sometimes it's the own, in all of scripture, this, I mean, this happens here in John chapter 2. The other gospels towards the end of Jesus' ministry describe a time, and some people say John isn't chronological. What he's doing is he's just putting these in order. Other people saying that there are two different times. I think it might have been two different times when I look at scripture. Either way, let's say it's two times in all of his ministry where Jesus acts like this, and there are some people that think Jesus is always like this. There are some people that have the attitude that God is always angry. God is always mad. He's always judgmental. He's always against them, which is really a misrepresentation of his overall character when you see how patient and gentle he is. He told those who sold pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. The place of worship, the sanctuary, modern day term, the church is not to be a house of trade. It, it, sometimes people say, well, church is a business. And I, I fight that with everything. I understand that, yes, we're a 501c3. There are legal tax ramifications and different things like that, that we are under a, a government, but it is not a business. In fact, I remember one time, one of our elders we were praying about something. Um, this is when I was pastoring a, 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 the church in Gilroy. And we got to this place where we all agreed that we were supposed to move. We, we saw a building. We felt like God was calling us to take a step of faith. We felt like we needed to do that. Um, and, and one elder said, I, I don't think so. So instead of like saying, well, you know, it's five to one, you know, like <laughs> we just said, well, why? And he goes, you know, I don't know. I have this check. So we said, let's pray. Let's seek the Lord. In fact, let's fast and let's see if God would reveal to us. And so we fasted, we prayed, we got back together and he said, let's go forward. And we said, we don't want to, like, we want to hear your concern. And he said, I'm absolutely certain in my heart that this is what we're supposed to do. And so I, I asked the question, what was the holdup? He said, I'm a business owner. And I thought of this as a business move. As a business owner, this is not a wise thing to do. It would not be a good thing to do business-wise. But as a pastor, taking steps of faith where God is leading us, it's above us, we should absolutely do this. And it was not, so, so Jesus is saying, don't make my father's house a house of trade. It's not for that. Um, his disciples remembered then that it was written zeal, for your house will consume me. Quoting from one of the Psalms, zeal for your house will consume me. You know, when I think about what we could be consumed by, we can be consumed by so many different things in our culture today. Uh, we could be consumed with sports. I, I wonder, I don't even wonder, I know, if if Paul or Peter or John were parachuted in, you know, they were zapped in to a football stadium during the Super Bowl. And they see this halftime show and then they see, you know, uh, touchdowns and they see people painting their face, you know, and they, they, they see the fanaticism. They see people fighting over their team and raising hands. They're looking at that going, this is full on worship. Now, 
I'm not being legalistic about like cheering. I, believe me, if you've watched games with me, I yell at my TV. I do all of those things. I get super excited about it. But I'll tell you, I was very convicted at one point in my life where for a, for a time in my life, I just gave up watching all sports because I felt like the Holy Spirit was asking me this question during a time of worship on a Sunday morning. Hey, you're so excited about the game that is happening after this worship service. Are you as excited about the things that I have? And in conviction, I was like, man, Lord, I am so sorry. And I just gave up sports for a season. And I, I started watching them again when I felt like the God, God gave me this green light where it wasn't a, I wasn't consumed so I could be excited about it, but it's different. Because if I'm not as excited and zealous for the things of God as I am for my hobby or my sport or my business or my finances or my food or drink or some other thing, then, then I have a worship problem. There's something in my heart that isn't right that God is making those adjustments. So this could even be for ministry. We could be so consumed with ministry and miss God in the midst of it. I mean, they're in a religious place, a place of worship, and they're missing the main aspect of that, which is God himself. We could miss it if church becomes something other than Jesus being central focus. If it becomes a social thing, if it becomes a, a, a thing of a cause, if it becomes a, an event thing. So they were not thinking about the Father stirred Jesus' zeal to act. They were making it convenient for some to worship. Now, this is interesting because G. Campbell Morgan brought something out that I had never seen before. Um, his understanding was that as people would come, yes, for some people, they would bring their animal to, to, to the temple. And then the, the people that are raising sheep there says, oh, yours isn't good enough. Here, here's one of ours. But then for Jewish people also, they could say, you know what? It's just such a hassle, such a hassle to raise our own sheep, to buy our own sheep, to inspect our own sheep. Let's just get one of their pre-approved sheep when we get there. We have enough money. Like we're pretty wealthy and let's just show up. Give me your best sheep. All right. And, and I'll offer that sheep. Um, sometimes we do things with unintended consequences. Um, to make it easy for people to worship. And it's, it's, as we were praying, as I was praying this morning, if you're watching online, I was praying, and, and if you're here, that God would um, help, help us to hear his heart. And I don't want to misinterpret that. Um, but we, we, it's so easy. And, and there is no effort at all for me to turn on a screen. Now, if you're watching because of, some other reason you can't be here in person, I understand that. Or, or there's times and seasons or if someone's sick or they're not able to. But the danger in it is that it, I don't even have to, I was going to say you could get up in your pajamas and go to the table and watch. You don't even have to do that. You could do this and roll over and still in your pajamas, turn it on and have it in your hand and watch, and then put it face down so you're not looking at it and just lay down there. And, and there's nothing wrong with listening to a message and taking that in in a way where I'm, I need to relax or whatever. But I'm saying that I think part of Jesus' zeal is that the pilgrimage to Jerusalem was meant to be intentional. It was meant to cause people to stop their work, to stop their calendar, to stop what was convenient for them, to actually go to Jerusalem, 75 miles, family, let's go, let's pack the donkey, let's bring all the stuff. Do you have the baby carrier? Yes, I got, do you have the bottle? Yeah, we got, do you have the diapers? Yeah, we got all the stuff, and, and then go. Oh, do we have extra snacks for on the way? Do you have the juice boxes? Do you have, and, and they are going, and then they get to Jerusalem, but as they're going, they're praying, and they're going through the Psalms of Ascent, and their hearts are getting ready to worship God on their way to church, so to speak. That it's not just like run out the door and get there, but it's preparation of our hearts to be able to hear from God. And when I don't do that, I could come into a worship service and be sitting here physically, but my heart and my mind, my soul still not there. 
because I'm still thinking about all these other things that are going on. And there's something about that intentionality that takes away the convenience that actually causes my heart to say, if I'm going to worship God and any zealous worship, anything that we're zealous about requires sacrifice. Um, when, when I was coaching track and field, there was a guy named Steve Manji. We were going up against Covina High School. And Covina High School had a record. Uh, they had a record of five years without losing a dual meet. And that was my first year. The next year was my first year as the, the head coach at South Hills High School. And I, I told our team at the beginning of the year, we're going to be Vala Vista League champions. That's our goal. Like, that's what we're going to do. So the last meet of the year happened to be against Covina High School. And a guy named Steve Manji did something that if you're a distance runner, you'll under, if you're not a distance runner, just try to imagine. He did a triple, which meant he ran three distance events in one meet. And I told him not to, I said, Steve, you're going to get injured. Like, I'm, I'm concerned more for you than about winning this meet. And he said, coach, please let me. Please let me. So I, I let him, and he won all three Actually, on one of them, he took second. He didn't have to because one of our other guys took first, and he just had to beat the first Kavina guy. And it came down to the very, the very last event, which is the 4x4 relay. We won the 4x4 relay, but because there was a, an event earlier that was a tie, anyway, we lost by, we lost by uh, a half a point. It, it was, and after the meet, we all get together, you know, and we're, we're out there on the track, and I, I talk about Steve, and I just start weeping. It, it's, just a, it's just a track and field event. It's just a game. It's just a sport. But let me tell you why. Because I understood what Steve was doing. He was sacrificing in, in pain for the, the rest of the team, not for himself. It wasn't to win three events. It was because he knew that if we were going to win, he had to sacrifice something. And my heart is always towards that. When I see someone that is sacrificing for their family or sacrificing for a team, I'm just drawn towards that zeal. But what does God see when he sees a heart that is full of that kind of a zeal? That he's not a second rate convenience thing. What does it feel like today? Am I tired today? Do, is it, what's the weather? Is there a game on this afternoon? I, I want to pray, but man, I'm so busy. I wish I had more time to pray. I wish I had more time to read my Bible. I wish I had more time to, and, and it's so easy. And when, when God sees zeal, I think his heart is also blessed. I think there's something when he sees that kind of zeal, that he's like, there's, there's one of my sons and one, one of my daughters that they just love me so much that they're willing to inconvenience themselves and sacrifice to draw near to me. I'll tell you another thing that stirred Jesus' zeal to act is that while it made it convenient for some, it made it difficult for others. I, they were making it really difficult for Gentiles. In the court of the Gentiles, these are the foreigners. These are the people who are the non-Jews. And they really didn't care about them and what this experience is like for them. And they just turned the court of the Gentiles into this marketplace. And it reminds me that there are people who don't know Christ that are confused about Jesus and we have to go to them to explain who Jesus is because they're confused. They think of Jesus as the turning over tables Jesus, but they don't realize that part of the turning over the tables is for them. Sometimes people have a misrepresentation of God and who he is and God is calling us to explain that to them and to inconvenience ourselves and take risk that they may misunderstand us. Um, there is a song that Keith Green sang. After I saw Jesus Revolution, I came home, started listening to these Keith Green songs that I started listening to when I was a, a, a new believer. And one of them was called Song to My Parents. And that song, Song to My Parents, is, he, he says, uh, his heart to his parents is, I know that sometimes we get together, my pride gets in the way, my words get mixed up, I'm such a poor example. It seems like I'm always talking about Jesus, but I just want you to know him. And sometimes we are, are not inconveniencing ourselves, and it's difficult for others to worship because they don't know the real Jesus, and so God's called us to make it easier for them by explaining who he is. 
Now, after Jesus does this, the Jews ask for this sign. They said, oh, what sign do you show us for doing these things? And by sign, it's like, what authority do you have? And Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days, I will raise it up. Now, there are some that say when Jesus was speaking, he may have even gestured to his body, destroy this temple, and in three days, I'll raise it up. I, I don't know, but I do know this. The Jews said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you'll raise it up in three days? I mean, Jesus, do you, do you know how long it took to do this? Do you know how big those stones are and how much labor intensive that was without machinery? And you think in three days you're going to just, you're just going to raise it up? And, and so Jesus, uh, let's see, there it is. There. Um, 46 years, you'll raise it up in three days. But he was speaking about the temple of his body. And when therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. And by the way, when did they understand his words? What does it say? After. When he was raised from the dead, his, deci dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this and they believed the scripture. I want to encourage you to read the Bible every day. There are some things that are not for today. There's sometimes you'll read it and go, huh, all right. God, what does this mean? I'm not sure. And, and there may be some time later on in your life that will cause you to understand what it is that God is speaking to you because you need it at that time. They understood it later, but they would have never understood it later had they not listened to Jesus's words. The Holy Spirit bring th brings things to our remembrance, but to bring something to our remembrance means that we've read it before, that we've heard it before. So listen to scripture, listen to the dwell app as you're driving, as it, you walk along the way, when you go to bed at night, when you eat, when you're, you know, just get God's word into you and then the Holy Spirit uses God's word. Now many believed in his name. It says in verse 23, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. So he was doing more signs than John enumerates here. And they believe, but sometimes it's a shallow belief. Do you know that there are levels of belief? Sometimes we think of it's either belief or unbelief, but sometimes there's levels of belief. They believe that he really believe, they, that he did these things or you know, he did these signs. But Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man for he himself knew what was in man. There are some people that believe because of signs that they see in their lives, a God doing things, but the moment that God doesn't answer their prayers, they stop believing. The moment that he doesn't do what they want him to do, or he answers it in a different way. Oh, okay, I'm not believing. Jesus doesn't commit himself to them. He knew what was in man. Now, there's a question with that. Many believed in his name. Some believed for a, a, a season. Some of those people that believed were probably some of the people that shouted crucify him, not to, you know, a, a couple of years after this. But when we believe in him, sometimes as Christians, as followers of Jesus, we could be followers of Jesus for a long time, but this apathetic kind of just casual kind of convenient religious observance starts to happen in our lives. And we don't feel it the same way. And some people stop following when they don't feel it. And feelings are going to come and go. Feelings are real, but we can't, they're not always reliable. Feelings are real, but they're not always trustworthy. Sometimes my feelings betray me. So when I have apathy, how do I overcome this apathy? Listen to this definition by Uche Anazor. Apathy is a psychological and spiritual sickness in which we experience a prolonged dampening of motivation, effort, and emotion, as well as a resistance to the things that would bring flourishing to ourselves and others. In his definition, he says, it is a sin 
that expresses itself as restlessness, aimlessness, laziness, and joylessness toward the things of God. Now, whether it's a sin or not, or if it's always a sin or not, I don't know. I think that there are times for sure that it is. But I do realize we're not helpless victims to our apathy. That when it just hits us like a virus, like, oh, I got apathy. Uh, like, okay, like I don't feel like doing anything. Uh, why not? Well, I'm just not motivated. I just don't want to. I just don't care. I just don't. And, and I don't think we're helpless victims, but there are some things that we could do to overcome that apathy. And, and I would suggest three tables for growing zeal. The first table was the table of feasting. Do you remember in the earlier part of this chapter, Jesus turns the water to wine and what happens? There's joy. There's vibrance. There's life. There's celebration. And I think that when it comes to this, when it comes to um, understanding the table that is there for feasting, sometimes we need to celebrate the goodness of God. You know, there's that song about, um, it's the goodness of God. What's the name of that song? Is it called the goodness of God? <laughs> that, it's called, thank you. I, I've just been singing that all year. That's my song of the year for 2023. And all my life, you've been faithful. All my life, you've been so, so good. Friday, we, we were going up to the men's retreat and um, Redwood Christian Park, no power, roads are closed, everything shuts down. And so I have hours on Friday, unplanned hours, and I'm so excited for these unplanned hours. And I grab my dog, Coda, and we drive up the coast to this secret beach that I won't tell you where it is or what the name of it is. And we hike down. I'm not going to Instagram it. I'm not going and, to... And we go, and I have me and my dog on, as far as the eye could see, up the coast and down the coast with no humans. And my dog is running around, and I'm walking on this beach... And as I'm walking on this beach and I'm, I'm noticing God's goodness and his creation and I'm praying and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit just starts to fill my heart with joy, starts to fill my heart with zeal, starts to fill my heart with the goodness of God. Not in the first hour, probably in about hour three in lingering in his presence, in being there. And there are times that our lives are so busy that we stop feasting at the table that he says, I set this table before you and here's a time for you to celebrate and to, to have time with me. And I'm like, God, I don't have time for that. I got stuff to do. I have places to go. I got people to see. I think the, the Psalm 63 illustrates it well. Oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there's no water. So I've looked for you in the sanctuary. That's the gathering of God's people, the feasting. It's, it's being together to see your power and your glory. My soul will be satisfied as with marrow and fatness. My mouth shall praise you with joyful lips. And I want to encourage you. This morning I was reading in Isaiah 30, uh, verse 15. This is what the sovereign Lord says. In repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength but you would have none of it. You said, no, we will flee on horses. Therefore, you will flee. You said, we will ride off on swift horses. Therefore, your pursuers will be swift. If I'm thinking I'm gonna earn my rest by working hard enough, God says, that's what's gonna consume you. That's what's gonna consume you. In fact, um, I wanted to share with you that Derek uh, and our elders, we've been talking and praying. He's been bringing some things up, uh, just needing a season of, of rest for his own life, a time of replenishment. And so we prayed about it and we said, hey, you could keep, he's like looking at duties. Like, what if I did some of this? And, and we said, what if you did nothing? What if you did nothing for a season as God ministers to you and your family? And so we all need that. Don't think that there's anyone that is immune. To, and if you say you don't need it, let someone else examine your life. <laughs> Ask someone else whether or not you, you need it. And I think that we see that we, we need it. Um, be in fellowship with other people of God. But then there's a, a second table, and it's turning over tables of your habits and what you repeatedly do. Um, in Hebrews, it says, we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. We need 
community. But let us lay aside the weight, every weight, and the sin which so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. If I want zeal to return, if you want zeal to return, there are some weights that you need to get rid of that I need to get rid of. Part of being a track and field coach is something called resistance training. One of my favorite exercises, because the guys loved it, the, the, the gals loved it, is running with a parachute on your back. Have you guys ever seen those? Those are really fun. If you've ever done it, you run with a parachute on your back, and, and you're just trying to run as fast as you can, and there's resistance training. But it's not good to run a race always with a parachute on your back. There are some weights that keep us from the things of God. Maybe it's social media. Maybe it's how much time I need. I, I, I believe this with all of my heart that we are entertaining ourselves to death. Some of the zeal that we would have for God, we don't have because we just entertain ourselves. Because we need every moment filled with noise and music and, 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 and videos and TikTok and little things like that. And then our minds just start to needlessly scroll or we're in the news or we're in work or something. We got to get rid of the weights, but we also got to get rid of the sins. This morning, if there is a sin that is unconfessed and unrepented of, God wants to give you rest. He wants to return your zeal. I don't feel zeal for God if I'm holding on to my sin. If I'm holding on to my, my lust, my anger, my materialism, my comfort, my convenience, my whatever it is, and I'm just holding on to that, then there's, there's a reason why I'm not experiencing zeal. And it comes together in this. It comes together the last table, the table of feasting, turning over tables. It's a table of communion. When we have communion with God in the presence of others, I could have communion alone. Okay, that's a cool thing. If you've never done it, go take some bread and a cup and go to some place on a beach or in the forest or your backyard or your car. Spend that time alone with the Lord. Have communion with God, but also have communion with others. My zeal grows when I'm around other zealous people for God. And when I'm around people who are passionate for the things of God, my passion for God begins to grow. So I want to in, in, encourage you to do that. And if I can have the worship team come up. When you commune with God, remember it was the night that Jesus was betrayed. I focus on Jesus. I remember he said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. I I remember he said, this, is the, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. Then when you do this, you do it together. You're announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. I want to encourage you to turn over some tables in your life. What table, which of those tables do you need the most? Do you need a, a table of feasting, a time away to just in, enjoy and delight in God, a Sabbath rest, a, a time of ceasing from work and just saying, God, I just want to be with you? Do you need to turn over tables of habits, tables of sin, tables of patterns, and I just need to, God to turn that table over? Or do I need the table of communion? Do I need to remember what he's done for me? and be around the people of God, and really draw near to the Lord. And so we are going to worship and allow the Holy Spirit to minister to us. And I honestly think that one of the greatest hindrances is our, what is the word? Self-consciousness. Our self-consciousness keeps us from worshiping God fully. We're so worried about what other people are going to think. We're so worried about, man, during this time, worship Jesus. If you want to do that in the stillness of your seat without singing because God has convicted you, do business with God. Open up your heart to God. If you want to raise your hands to the Lord, then raise your If you need prayer, don't think, oh, that is for the people who really need it. We all need it. Come, ask for prayer. If there's an area that is a stronghold in your life. You want to turn over that table of habit or sin and you're like, I've tried, I can't do it. Then come to the Lord. Humble yourself enough 
to say, I need prayer from someone else or someone to come alongside of me. Jesus is the one that answers the prayer, but it, it's in the presence of one another. And let's bring these things to God. Who knows what God wants to do in Santa Cruz County? Who knows what God wants to do in our lives? Let's pray. Father, this morning we thank you for this account of Jesus' life in which his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house has consumed me. God, our, our culture today sees zeal for so many other things. But when it's zeal towards you, our culture calls it fanaticism. So God, we pray for a zeal that is not without knowledge, not a zeal outside of your word, but a zeal that really comes from your spirit working in us. And God, would you turn over the tables in our lives of self-consciousness, of habit, the tables of apathy and lethargy, the tables of being overly concerned of what other people are thinking about me. God, I pray that you would turn over the tables of unbelief. And God, that you would bring us to the table of feasting, the table of joy, a table of communion with you. And so today, Holy Spirit, draw us towards yourself. And the gentle way that you do those things, we surrender. God, we believe. Help our unbelief. God, we surrender. And then we say, please take from me the things that are too difficult for me to let go of. My pride, my reputation, God, my plans, we submit them to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's worship the Lord together.